we can do a battery of tests, but we might not know what's like going on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's always like really hard to navigate, especially when um, you're not in a medical field or life science field. And I'm just wondering, like for both of you, after you receive like the advice from the doctor, like was it helpful? Was it not helpful? I fired my doctor. She just sent me a message. You have type 2 diabetes. I'm prescribing metformin. Start taking two pills daily. That was it. There was nothing. She wow. simply said, you have an illness. I'm prescribing a medication. Yeah. I'll talk to you next time you're in the office. I also had a very tough time with my first few um, doctors. Like first I went to my GP and then I went to like a specialist that they recommend a cardiologist. You know, it was so frustrating because like no matter what kind of diagnosis I got, like they just kept telling me that, hey, I don't know what's going on. And the worst thing that I've heard actually from a doctor and no one should ever have to hear this is that I've never seen this before. <laughs> I'm like, cool, who has seen this before? <laughs> <laughs> who should I talk to? Because yeah. you don't know what you're talking about, which is okay. I'm yeah. not blaming you for that, but stop making me see you. I want to see someone else that might know what they have that's going on with my body. And dude, my body is something I need to know because it's my life, right? That's right. Welcome to the Level Up With Us podcast, where we talk about amazing perspective shifts that we've had throughout our lives about important topics that matter to us in the world. So hopefully we can put ourselves in a position where we know that things are going to be okay, right? The situation we find ourselves in might seem alarming, might seem stressful, might seem really intense for us, but life is okay, right? As long as we can see it from a different perspective. And we want to show you that there's many ways to see a specific situation. Today, we have an amazing guest with us. We have Drew. Uh, we're on the way in sunny San Francisco, and we are here to have an amazing conversation with him. He's actually been a Co-Extreme member since 2019, 2020. Like he was one of the first 100 people that joined our community. And we finally had the chance to meet in person at his lovely hacker house here in San Francisco. Uh, and today we're going to talk about an amazing and interesting topic that I think is relevant for everybody, which is um, our perspective shifts when it comes to dealing with a life-changing diagnosis of an illness. So without further ado, I'm going to jump straight to Drew. And Drew, can you introduce yourself a little bit, just who you are, what you're doing, and you know, how, what is your relationship with illness <laughs> and sure. diagnosis? It's a big question, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm Drew. Uh, I live in San Jose, California. About six months ago, I was diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes. Oh, wow. And so that was um, kind of out of the blue. I didn't expect it, didn't know that was coming, had no symptoms. Um, so yeah, that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. Really appreciate Drew for coming out and sharing about his experience. Like, um, I think for many of us, we don't expect to have such a life-changing diagnosis. And obviously, as we get older, we might start thinking about it a bit more, but we don't expect it to happen to us, mm -hmm. right? And I think when you shared your story of how, you know, this happened only in the past year, I think, right? Um, it was really inspiring for me to kind of talk about it because I think a lot of people at home, you know, you can go online, you can read all things about like how to deal with diabetes, how to deal with this, you know, diagnosis. But I think a lot of that is coming from a perspective of, you know, the doctors. It's like, okay, this is what you need to do, you know, action-wise. This is what you need to do to solve the problem. But emotionally, I think there's a lot that goes on. And I just want to ask you, like, how did you feel when you first got this diagnosis? And how did you kind of manage those emotions as you went on? I felt a lot of surprise, obviously. I'm relatively young. I'm 37. I was 36 at the time of the diagnosis. I didn't have any symptoms to indicate like, hey, you should be worried about this. Um, and you asked about my relationship to health or, or wellness. Yeah. I've had a very blessed life. I've had, um, you know, no reason to, to um, have to worry about illness the way that, that unfortunately some people do. And so I've been really lucky in that mm. I think I walked around life thinking like, I'm immortal. My body can handle anything. <laughs> and I true. think for, for many well people, that is kind of how you walk through the world. You mm -hmm. know, um, you go like, that'll happen to somebody else, but not me. Sure, sure. Absolutely. And I think like, tell me a bit about the story of how you got to the diagnosis. Like what was the leading up factors to like, okay, something seems off about my body. Something seems weird. Like, how did you get there? Sure. I, you know, I, the, the cause, you know, the thing that led up to this was I had gained weight. I was working at a couple startups during the pandemic and I was working normal startup hours, you know, whatever, between 40 to 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And I probably wasn't sleeping enough, probably wasn't eating well, probably wasn't exercising enough. 
And when I say probably, I mean definitely. <laughs> and I uh, had gained some weight. So I'm 5'10", so in, mm-hmm. you know, feet and inches. I'm 5'10". Five, five that's, um, you know, my, my body weight, I, there's a wide scale, but I was definitely above where I should be for being 5'10", you mm-hmm. know. Uh, my body weight should be somewhere between maybe like 150 would be pretty lean. Right. And maybe 170, 180 would be kind of the the upper end of where the medical institution would say, okay, that's like your healthy weight range. Sure. I had gotten up to about 205. Okay. So I was a little bit, I, I was outside that. I was in the overweight category, not mm. quite to the obese category. But if you looked at me, you'd be like, yeah, you could stand to lose a little bit of weight. But nobody would have been like, Hey, you really need to, yeah, to slim down, you know. Yeah, you you're you're probably at risk for some chronic disease. Right. right. That would not have been what you would have said. But an interesting thing to note about diabetes is that for type two diabetics, it's really only about eighty percent of people mm-hmm. who are type two diabetic are overweight or obese. I see. So there are a full twenty percent of people who have type two diabetes that are not overweight. Right. So it's it's not it's not completely correlated with with weight, but for many people it is. You know. And so anyway, for me. That was kind of what led up to it. That's what caused it mm-hmm. is that I was gaining weight, wasn't taking care of my body mm. at the way that I should have. And uh, my uh, partner encouraged me to go to the doctor and get some blood work done because mm. I was just a little bit worried about my cholesterol. And and uh, she said, you need to, you know, go get blood work. Have you talked to your doctor? And I was like, no, I'm just handling it through nutrition. She's like, no, you should really go get blood work done. And so I did. I went and talked to my doctor and we just did kind of a full routine blood panel um, my cholesterol came back in a, in an okay range, mm-hmm. um, okay risk range, but my doctor said you have type two diabetes and that was just out of nowhere, complete, no. complete surprise. Wow. Um, thanks for sharing your diagnosis experience. And I think we talked a little before and you mentioned that, um, it was really, there were challenges to, I think, changing your lifestyle and like nutrition wise, I think in the beginning. And I wanted to know more like, how were your, how did you feel when you heard about the diagnosis and how did it get to the, like, how did it lead up to the point where you're like, Hey, this is what I'm changing and I will try it now. Like, how was that process for you? Sure. I definitely went through the stages of, you know, I, I don't know that I had like a flash of anger, but I definitely had denial for at sure. least 48 hours. Right. I yeah. was like, is this wrong? Right. And I actually did go back and test my A1C again, mm-hmm. the wow. the clinical marker. The, yeah. Is this right? The clinical yeah, yeah, the diagnostic marker, diagnostic marker mm-hmm. for type mm-hmm. two diabetes is your hemoglobin A1C, mm-hmm. right? You can go get this tested, uh, with uh, just a simple blood draw from your doctor. Um, you can get it tested every two to three months, every two to three months, your body turns over your entire supply of red blood cells mm. and your hemoglobin A1C is a measure of how much blood glucose has attached to the hemoglobin on your red blood cells, right? right? And so you can get this tested every two to three months and kind of get a fresh reading. Um, but I was concerned that maybe there was an error in the lab, right? I thought, this doesn't seem right. Like I shouldn't have diabetes. So yeah. I did go back and get retested and my A1C was the same on both readings, which, mm-hmm. you know, showed this wasn't a mistake. This wasn't a, a false mm-hmm. positive. Um, so yeah, so for about 48 hours, I did have, I'm like, denial and and just kind of this like cognitive dissonance of like this can't be right um but i think i relatively quickly adjusted to reality i went okay this is the reality how do i deal with it yeah. um i think the the tools that helped me do that and and make that transition quickly were um not trying to make the world or or my experience something that it's not right i'm not going to like pretend that this doesn't exist like if the data shows that i have diabetes Mm -hmm. like i need to reconcile myself with the reality quickly so that i can you know start taking action and and some of that just involves like not letting your ego get in the way Mm -hmm. right you know i had to change that perspective of like i'm invincible this couldn't happen to me i had to really quickly get into like oh, I need to make a change really yeah. fast, you know? And then I think the other thing that really helped was just like not not being ashamed. I, For me, there was an element of, of like shame. Oh, like, oh, because I think especially with diabetes, at least in the United States, I don't know about other cultures, but at least in the United States, I think there is definitely an element of like, you did this to yourself. This is your fault, especially oh, because wow. it's a lifestyle mm-hmm. disease and the a lot of the preventative measures or solutions are also lifestyle driven, Mm -hmm. it makes people naturally go, this is my fault, right? Mm. So that's not what I'm saying. There is a genetic component. 
there is an environment and lifestyle component. But I think for a lot of people, this would lead to feelings of like guilt, shame. I don't want to share this. I'm, yeah. I'm embarrassed about this. And just being able to get over that, like if you can just help yourself get over that really quickly. Yeah. For, for me, what I did was within 24 hours, I told my partner. And then that really helped to kind of talk through, um, you know, like what's next? How do I handle this? How do we handle this? Yeah. Um, and so I, for me, I think those were the two things was just like reconciling with reality quickly and not spending a lot of time in like denial or, or trying to like, oh no, you know, mm. you know, shift it somehow, spin it somehow. And then, and then, uh, um, enlisting help. Mm. I really appreciate you sharing that Drew. And actually I want to share experience of my own. Um, I resonated with your story because, you know, the, I think around, like from young, actually, like I had this thing where um, I, my mom always put me into like these sports camps. So like I would have to like, you know, have to, but <laughs> I had fun, like go to like badminton class and like, you know, do certain things. And like when they would drill me, they would often like drill me very hard, right? It's like you have to, you know, for a whole hour, you're gonna have to run back and forth and do things. And when I was younger, I was, you know, more fit than I am now, obviously. But like within like, you know, good 10, 15 minutes, I'd be like out of breath. I'd be panting. I'd be seeing black spots in the vid my vision. Mm -hmm. And every time that happened, all my coaches would tell me, hey, you're weak you suck, you should be able to do this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Since young, okay? Mm -hmm. So I always thought that that was just normal, right? If you ran too hard, right, you see black spots. Mm -hmm. And if you see black spots and you don't keep running, you suck, mm -hmm. right? So you're the problem. And I always had this problem where like, if I ever overexerted myself, I would have to like lay down, put my feet up, right? And kind of like get the blood flowing back in my head. I just thought that was a normal thing people did, right? I, I, I didn't have that much reference. I didn't ask that many people. I was just like, hey, this is me. This is my body. And I assume my body is everyone else's body too, right? As a kid, you don't really think too much about that. So I kind of grew up with that understanding. It's like, hey, you know what? I can exercise. I can do a lot of things. But if I push myself a bit too hard, I will see black spots. But I should put myself hard because I am a guy. I'm a man. I am capable. I am, uh, I'm going to work out and, you know, and you always see the like, Arnold Schwarzenegger videos where it's like, yeah, push yourself until the limit. All right. That's the only way to gain muscle. And like, just a lot of like media is like all about like push yourself to the limit so that you can actually improve yourself. So I kind of believe that. But what happened is uh, around two years ago, I had my third case of COVID. And then after that third case of COVID, I started having a lot of weird things happen to my body. Um, I started getting really lightheaded really easily. I started like losing my breath, just walking upstairs, right? I started like just really um, getting those symptoms I used to get, you know, the black spots and everything, just very, very quickly. I'd get out of bed, you know, and that I already have black spots, right? Mm. Uh, walk upstairs, I have black spots, you know, I go outside, walk my dog, you know, like five minutes later, I'm like, <sighs> <sighs> like I was dying and I was like, what is going on? Um, and so, you know, I really was confused and I started, you know, going to the doctor a little bit. I was like, Hey, this is a bit weird, right? I'm, I'm feeling very off and I want to know what's going on. And, um, they started giving me like some information. It's like, oh, okay. Um, you know, looks like you have, might have a heart issue or your ECG has like some weird bumps like, on, on here. And they like, give me a battery of tests, like ECG echoes, x-rays, just like tried everything to see like what's wrong with my heart and what's going on there. And then they were just like, you know what? Nothing really looks wrong with your heart, but like if anything happens more, just let us know and we'll get back to you, like kind of sure. thing. So like not, nothing, like they, they didn't find it serious. And again, if they don't find it serious and in my brain working out means you got to push yourself. Like I didn't think anything too much of it, right? I was just like, okay, this is just how life is going to be a little bit, right? And you know, I'm just weak and I still kind of put myself in that mentality. Uh, but then what happened was actually, so... Um, I kept getting more and more weird things happen in my body. Like it was a course of like, it all started like my third bout of COVID was like around like a year and a half ago. So like that kind of triggered me to go to the doctor once. And then I had another situation where I kind of woke up and, um, oh gosh, you know, so right after I recovered from COVID, like a few weeks after I slipped and fell in my bathtub mm -hmm. and I hit my head, I had a huge concussion. Uh, it hurt a lot, but I didn't go to the doctor then because I kind of like, I, I kind of did the things where like, oh, yeah, I can still follow a finger, you know, like I don't feel too off. So maybe that's fine. But after that, I just got chronic headaches for like the next like week. Like it was just so painful. But I just always attributed it to, you know, that fall. So I was like, hey, nothing too bad's going on. Then a week after that, I woke up and I started like, having like huge chest pain, 
right? And like just fainting spells, right? And stuff like that. And then like my chest pain was so bad. It was like an eight out of 10. And like, I had to go to the emergency room immediately. And so I went to the emergency room and I was like, okay, doctor, this is what's going on with me. And I like started listing all my symptoms. I have head pain. I, I, I have, you know, black flashes of, you know, splotches uh, once in a while. Like I faint once in a while and I walk upstairs. It's like, whoa, 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 hold a second. Like you have so many things. You have no idea what's going on. And I'm like building this narrative in my head. It's like, I think A leads to B leads to C. And then like, but I had no idea what was going on. I'm just like, just keep telling people my symptoms, right? And I used Notion. I kept track of everything that was, that was happening to me, right? But like, it wasn't necessarily from a place of like, hey, I understand my body and what's going on, but more as like, hey, this is like the things that I think that are happening to me. And like you, fix my problem, right? You're the doctor, you're the expert, fix me, okay? So then all these things kind of came together and then like i'm like okay i need to start seeing the doctor more i need to start like really going deeper into the cardiologist and seeing what they have to say about this and i went through like three four five different cardiologists to kind of figure out what's wrong with my heart i went to a neurologist to figure out what's wrong with my head but like they just could never really fix anything right and so i think then coming back to all this right um what really changed me and really helped me was I then knew that I had, you know, so many different things I needed to solve. I have a chronic head pain that now persists like just all the time, right? And I needed to see a doctor for that. I needed to figure out what was going on there. I have this, you know, breathing issue, right? That I need to figure out that, you know, could possibly be caused by a high, high heart rates, right? Which then triggers, you know, my blood pressure to do something weird and I pass out. Um, but I'm just trying to really accept that, like, you know, I have issues with my body, right? I'm not as invincible as I might think in the past. And I don't need to conform to any beliefs that like, I just need to push harder, right? I have my limits and that's okay, right? I'm human, right? To be human is to err and to have limits and to not be perfect. And I think, um, you know, there's so much more of a story too, I'm sure. But yeah, that's, that's a bit of, I think the down low of what happened to me. Thanks for sharing your experience for both of you. I think, um, I personally haven't gone through a diagnosis like this yet, but I can see how like learning about your stories, how much impact it could have on both of your lives. And I'm like really sorry you guys have to go through that experience. But I think like the way that you guys explain how you kind of got through is really admirable to me. Um, and I think one thing I didn't actually realize until now was that for a lot of common uh, I guess illnesses that we have, we can go to the doctors and maybe like get a clear diagnosis. But it's like for, I guess, more uncertain uh, reasons or for any illnesses is where it gets scary because we can do a battery of tests, but we might not know what's like going on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's always like really hard to navigate, especially when um, you're not in a medical field or life science field. And then you're like, hey, what's going on? Like I'm going to the doctors, they're telling me a general like kind of conclusion and I just got to work with that. And I'm just wondering like for both of you, after you receive like the advice from the doctor, um, how did you use it to your advantage? Like was it helpful? Was it not helpful? And if it wasn't, what other resources were you able to like go find to help? I fired my doctor. Yep. Same. I fired my <laughs> cardiologist. I was like, this guy sucks. <laughs> so, so here's the story. And here's why I think that's an important part of the story is because you need to be able to hold two things in your mind at the same time, right? Yeah. We hear that that is like a mark of intelligence yes. or I don't know, you might have a different definition, but, but being able to hold two things that may seem like they oppose each other that oftentimes is the key to like understanding yes. or acceptance or finding a solution. In my case, the two things I needed to hold were one, I need to seek help. Yeah. Right. So I wouldn't have even known about this diagnosis if my partner hadn't strongly encouraged me to go get blood work done and talk to a doctor. I did that. And then I realized that my doctor, my, my current primary care physician, my PCP, yeah. was really just interested in prescribing medication and sending me out the door. And she yeah. was really a medication mercenary where she was yeah. just like, and, and literally her, her delivery was through a secure message, you know, on, oh on Kaiser, you, you know, yeah. I'm a, a Kaiser Permanente member. She just sent me a message. You have type 2 diabetes. I'm prescribing metformin. Start taking two pills daily. That was it. No, no conversation about lifestyle mm -hmm. changes, no conversation about how to 
um, tackle this either through treatment, maintenance, management. There was no conversation about diet, mm -hmm. sleep, exercise, stress. There was nothing. She wow. simply said, you have an illness. I'm prescribing a medication. Yeah. I'll talk to you next time you're in the office. It was That's crazy. insane, yeah. it, you know, from my perspective. Um, and so my point is, is that you need to both seek out resources and information and help that are outside of you and outside of your sphere and outside of your, your current knowledge, but you are ultimately the decision maker and yes. you're ultimately the decider. Yeah. The doctor is not the one in charge of your health. You're the one in charge of your health. So you both need to seek help and also know when the help that you're getting has reached its usefulness and you need to go seek help in a different area, right? Absolutely. And so I fired my, my doctor Wonderful. and I just went doctor shopping and, and found another doctor within the Kaiser network who had a lot of experience with uh, type two diabetes, had worked in a, in a diabetes clinic. Specifically for me, what I was looking for was someone that wasn't afraid to use the words reverse okay. diabetes, right? Yeah. A lot of times doctors yeah. will use words like manage or maintain, mm. this is a chronic illness. And again, if your approach to to treating this is just to prescribe metformin, and then eventually this is going to get so bad that we'll put you on insulin. Yeah. Then of course you're going to use words like maintain yeah. and progressive illness. And but I wanted to find somebody who was willing to say, no, absolutely. this is absolutely reversible. This has a lifestyle cause right. and it has lifestyle change. You know, it has lifestyle solutions, right? And so I found a doctor that was willing to speak that language mm -hmm. and who believed that's that. Beautiful. Uh, so that's how I handled it was to, you know, seek help. And when I realized I was kind of hitting a wall and it wasn't to my standards, what I expected for my life, yeah. I like fired that resource and went and found a, a new one that, that was a better fit for me. Absolutely. And I think like I actually really agree with that, like holding two opposing ideas in balance. Um, I call it like the yin and yang, right? Basically, like and, and it applies in so many places. Like, I'm so glad to apply for you here because I think it's so such an important concept that a lot of people don't realize. It's like, hey, you know, we think that there's a one track, one right answer to things, but there's actually so many ways you can approach it. And sometimes you need a counter -oppose, opposition mm -hmm. idea to really break through on that. And I think a good example of that for me was like, so I also had a very tough time with my first few um, doctors. Like first I went to my GP and then I went to like a specialist that they recommend a cardiologist. And the thing about, you know, specialists is that they make a lot of money by getting you to do all their diagnoses and do everything like do an ECG, do an echo, do all those things, an x-ray, whatever. And I get all the diagnosis, like all those scans are important. Like I don't disagree that those scans are important, but I think every time a scan goes through and they're like, oh, we found nothing remarkable of notes, you know, I'm like, find something remarkable. I, I just need an answer. I need to know what is going on. Because at that time, all I knew was that like, hey, you know, there's either something wrong with my heart, right? And that's why I'm doing all these fainting spells, right? Or there's something wrong with my body in some other part of the body that I have no idea, some neurochemical issue, right? Neurotransmitters getting misfired and whatnot. And the difference between those is one, I'm gonna die before I'm 30, right? And the other one is I'm going to, you know, have a lifelong issue that I'm going to have to deal with. I can't have my heart rate rise up too much. I can't drink uh, certain drinks. Uh, I can't, you know, uh, do certain workouts. I can't, you know, like there's a lot of lifestyle change. I need to know how, what to do, right? And all they could say is like, hey, just start doing those lifestyle changes today, right? Just in case, like, again, it's all just preventative to so not raise my heart rate. But hey, if you get a little bit stressed, you know, so maybe, you know, if you're just driving, you're stressed and then you just like pass out and then I guess you're crashed and you're going to die. Right. Or as I'm doing any sort of exercise, like they said, I couldn't do any sort of like, you know, rock climbing or anything like that, because like in case like I actually just pass out, like who's going to hoist me back up. Right. Like I need a lot of support systems. I, I can't do, you know, uh, what was it? Um, what's the thing jumping out of a plane? Um, skydiving. skydiving, right? I can't do skydiving, right? I mean, again, those are like extra things that I'd be lucky to do and in any case, right? But just knowing that like I had limits to my capabilities and my abilities was super frustrating. I needed to know what the answer was, if only just to find an answer. And so, you know, it was so frustrating because like no matter what kind of diagnosis I got, like they just kept telling me that, hey, I don't know what's going on. And the worst thing that I've, heard actually from a doctor and no one should ever have to hear this is that I've never seen this before. <laughs> I'm like, cool. Who has seen this before? 
<laughs> who should I talk to? Because yeah. you don't know what you're talking about, which is okay. I'm yeah. not blaming you for that. But stop making me see you. I want to see someone else that might know what they have that's going on with my body. And dude, my body is something I need to know because it's my life, right? That's right. And I think like that's the most like my breakthrough moment there was really like I think Jess had a lot to do with that. Like she was super helpful throughout all of it where you know, she went with me to the doctor visits. She helped me compile a lot of the different things that they were saying. She went and found studies that had people had the similar issue because um, they have a very specific scientific term that explains when you have a drop of heart rate, a drop of blood pressure when your heart rate goes up. And like, but the cause of that can be so many things. Like I said, it can be a heart problem, can be whatever. And um, what Jess helped me do was that she went and started looking into all these different things that like potentially could be this problem and we got in touch with many specialists or around around you know the country and just really tried to find the right person that could possibly help with this issue yeah. right um also like what i decided to do similar to you i was like hey you know what i don't care what they're saying anymore i'm gonna do some things that i can help me keep my heart rate down right because they're all saying things like you know um just avoid all these things right but i'm like hey how can i make myself fit enough to the point where i can just do some exercise and yeah. know that my heart rate doesn't spike to 180 right yeah. COVID or not, right? How do I make sure that I can actually have like a healthy enough body where my heart rate keeps low? And that's the point of people doing exercise anyways, is to keep a low heart rate, right? Yeah, yeah. So I started doing those things, right? I started doing like small amounts of exercise that were like, you know, help me gradually build up that endurance while I wait for whatever diagnosis is going to come from this guy, right? And I think that was like really, really resonate with me for your story, which is like, you know, you just got to look within sometimes, you know, you just got to see like, hey, you know what? you had a very strong conviction. I want to reverse diabetes. I right. don't want to just manage it. Right. Right. I don't want to just, you know, be waiting for death. You know, I don't want to just say, Hey, you know, I guess I can't do 20 things that I might want to do in the future. Right. Yeah. Um, and I want yeah. to pick up on that because, you know, Jess, you asked like, how did you handle it? What was the initial kind of reaction or response? And it, you know, this concept of like, you're the boss, you're the CEO of your life, your doctor is not your boss, yeah. your doctor is a consultant, your doctor is an advisor, right? You're the CEO, you're the one in charge of your health and your decisions and how you're going to lead your life. Because again, they can't make you take your medication, they can't make you exercise. Mm -hmm. the, the best they can do is you check in three months later, six months later, a year later, and they go, Oh, did you do the things that I prescribed and you either say yes or no, but they're not there with you day to day. Mm -hmm. You're the boss, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to realize like one, when, when the resources, the, the advisors in your corner aren't the right ones, right? You go seek mm -hmm. someone, someone else. But the other part of that really kind of taking this, taking control of this, like grabbing the bull by its horns is like, go educate yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, and look, I'm not, there, there's no blame here, but I think the way that a lot of people would approach this is only seek advice from the doctor. And then in their mind, that's good enough. They went, I saw the doctor, the doctor told me this, I'm doing what the doctor said, what else do you want from me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My method of learning is I, I listen to a lot of audio, mm -hmm. right? So I don't read physical books very quickly. I don't tend to read a lot of blogs online. Mm -hmm. um, but I listen to audio all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I listen to hours of audio a day. So for me, educating myself through podcasts was very easy or books, right? Mm -hmm. Long form audio books, right? right? And so I found, I probably listened to at least four or five different uh, podcasts where the focus is reversing type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. or, or reversing, you know, blood glucose, lowering blood glucose, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I found one that had a lot of uh, like medical information and where I was both educating myself and learning what kind of like interventions, lifestyle mm -hmm. interventions would help, help me solve this problem. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that just comes down to ultimate accountability lies yeah. within you, right? Yeah. Like it's not somebody else's job to fix your life. Exactly. And this has nothing to do with like fault. This has nothing to do with blame. This isn't like victim blaming, but like if it doesn't matter where it came from, it doesn't matter if it, if it was a genetic uh, uh, predisposition or you got here through lifestyle. And, and the truth is it's probably a combination of those things. The point is you're here, yeah. right? And the point is, is like, you're going to decide how you want to live your life. Yeah. And so for me, that involved, I had to go educate myself. And so I listened to, I'm not kidding, mm -hmm. hundreds of hours mm -hmm. of podcasts. I would just mm -hmm. be walking the neighborhood, which by the way, is one of the best things to do if you have <laughs> metabolic syndrome and yeah. if your right. metabolism isn't, isn't, functioning properly, mm -hmm. which is what type 2 diabetes is, mm -hmm. is uh, you should probably spend a lot of time walking specifically after meals that helps so to even out the glucose mm -hmm. in your in your bloodstream. And so while I'm walking the neighborhood, I would be listening to podcasts about how to reverse diabetes. Right. 
That's amazing. I think it's so great that you took ownership of your health in this case. But I think that is really translatable to everything, right? Like once you take ownership of whatever situation you're in, you're so much able to like make bigger strides. Um, and I also wanted to add to the point of, I guess, the medical system right now. Of course, I don't know all the medical systems in the world, but I do like through my years of study, I've realized that Western medicine is very statistics based. So all the medication that you're getting and all the diagnoses that you're getting from your doctor, they're all based on like probability wise, like statistically, mm -hmm. who has this, like who does this uh, medication help the most? Like which one helps the most? And then who has this diagnosis like most commonly? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's really important to understand that what diagnosis or medication you get it will work for the majority of the people who take it, but there are a fraction of people who, if they do take it, it may not help them. And I think that's the other thing about medicine from what I learned is that there are a lot of people who are very great at their job. Like they specialize and they are such experts in their field. But like you mentioned, if it's something that is outside of their specialty, it's quite, it's quite difficult sometimes for them to know because they are so focused on their own specialty that they read all the papers, all the research on that specialty. So that's why when you, when there is something going on with your body that you're not sure about, it's like beautiful when you find the correct doctor who like knows what is happening to you. Right. But I can see how it can be really frustrating and scary to, to kind of see somebody who like is not sure of where you're at. Right. Yeah. I'm just curious, like, did understanding your condition help you? Like, was that the step that I, that really helped push you beyond, like, to actually do something about it? Like, because I think a lot of people, like, when what came to mind when you started talking about, like, hey, a lot of people put their whole trust into a doctor. Right. Is that you actually lose a lot of agency over your own body and over your own health. You don't want to understand what's going on. You just want someone to solve the problem for you. And I think that's actually what blocks a lot of people from actually doing something and reversing a condition that they might be finding themselves in, right? Whereas like, they're not diving deeper into like understanding all the in and outs of it. Because again, it's your body, right? Yes, there is a doctor that is professionally trained that could potentially help you with that. But ultimately, you need to be the expert of whatever is happening to you, right? So would you say that that acceptance of like, hey, this is what I have and understanding more about it was really what pushed you to take the actions that now you're healthy, active, you know, doing your best, obviously, but I see them a big difference probably, right? For you. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding and finding resources that help you understand yeah. in a clear way mm -hmm. what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. what levers you can pull yeah. that, that are going to have leverage Absolutely. And, and what's not effective, mm -hmm. which medications are going to have, you know, a high payoff. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe how those things work together, what effects you would expect to see in your body. Like if I make these changes, what am I looking for? What are my metrics of success here? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah, it all comes down to approaching it with curiosity. Yeah. Right. If I'm afraid of the topic, yeah, it's going to be very hard for me to approach it in a way that I'm open to learning and open to accepting and, and kind of like internalizing what I learn. Uh, so yeah, so approaching with curiosity rather than skepticism, yeah. right? Or fear or something. Just getting really, really deeply curious about like, mm -hmm. okay, here I am. What you know, and and I've taken ultimate ownership, right? Like I'm I'm in charge here. Yeah. I'm the boss. I'm the owner. Right. I'm the one who has to live with the consequences, right? So yeah. those kind of things. And then yeah, you go discover the resources. And yeah, so that really helped me. Um, once I found a resource that was useful for educating me in those things, yeah. the, the great thing about type two diabetes is unlike many other conditions, it is extremely lifestyle oriented. That's great. This is yeah. not something where your doctor is just going, I mean, your doctor might tell you this, but it's not true. <laughs> it is not a condition mm -hmm. where your doctor should just say, it is what it is. We yeah. don't know anything yeah. else about it. This is the best we can do right now. Yeah. Just like you know, try and be comfortable, take your medicine, mm -hmm. don't think about it. That is not type 2 diabetes. Right. A lot. We, know, we know quite a lot about how to reverse this. Yeah. And it comes down to, I, I'm not a doctor, right? Like I'm not someone mm -hmm. who's, who's qualified to consult, but I've seen changes in my lifestyle mm -hmm. that have resulted in me losing weight, losing mm -hmm. body fat, and my metrics got better, mm -hmm. right? Wonderful. And so, yeah. um, 
Yeah. So anyway, but it, it took that curiosity. It, it mm -hmm. took approaching it with like an open mindset and, you know, like just radical ownership. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I was, I was able to find like, okay, this is largely driven by lifestyle. Right. And again, that goes back to like nutrition, sleep, stress. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I was able to make changes in my life that, that helped me, you know, bring my, my A1C down. Amazing. So. Yeah. Like I absolutely understand and appreciate that you've gone through this journey and, I think you said something really important is that like, you know, if you keep avoiding it, you're not actually going to be able to solve any problem. Right. And this reminds me like, and this is something I shared with you when we first met just a few days ago. Right. Uh, but something we think about a lot in the foundation is like, you know, what are the different stages that we have to go through before we can actually effectively take action on something? And I think this is where a lot of like self-help and personal development, you know, resources fail us is that they just tell you like, Hey, get over yourself, just do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's very empathetic to our real challenges, right? In that moment, we're emotional. We are in a stage where we don't know what's going on, right? When we're scared, we are worried, right? About the future. And there's so many th things that just well up within us. And so the first thing is overcoming that avoidance that you have. And that's the first A, we call it the 4A model of understanding, right? The first A is avoidance and how you get over that is to feel safe, right? I love that you found a partner to help push you and help guide you in that journey, right? I'm so happy I have Jess as well that helps, you know, kind of nurture me along that path because I think feeling safe is the most important thing so that you can actually start doing something about what you have. But again, feeling safe isn't all there is. You start having to look within and start being aware of your situation, right? What is the thing that you're going through, right? What are the feelings you're going through? Yes, I'm feeling grief. Yes, I'm feeling sad. Yes, I'm feeling, you know, absolutely destroyed, right? That this is happening to me. Why me? Certainly feel that. You should absolutely feel that. Right. But understand that these are your feelings and try to go deep within that. Right. What exact feelings am I feeling and where are they coming from? Understand yourself through your emotions. And then the next step after that is acceptance. Right. Accept that you're in this position. Right. No one else is in control of your life other than you. Yes, 100 percent. You know, why me? But like it is happening to you. Right. How do we get here? Let's look at it. Right. If it's lifestyle, fantastic. Let's figure out where in the lifestyle we can change. Right. Because we don't know where to look. You don't know what you can do about it. Right. So going to that. Right. And then finally, then taking effective action, I think is so important. And I think that's where you, again, closing the loop on the thing we said before is that is the effective action just finding our doctor and listening to what they have to say, or is it looking at your own secondary sources, right? Doing your own research, right? And understanding that. Um, is it also applying some things in your own life to see what actually changes, right? Because if you just wait for the six month checkup to see like, hey, your blood sugar is still that same way it was, you know, last six months. Hey, you probably could have checked, you know, once a month, right? And seen what actually could change. And I think that's, you know, a lot of what I think about nowadays where it's like, how can I just keep putting myself through this perspective that like, hey, you know, I don't suck for not doing something about it. I just haven't gone through the appropriate steps mm -hmm. to actually help me take an appropriate action that will change my life ideally. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the 4A model. Is that what you called it? Yeah. So, and this is a homegrown model, right? This yes. is not attributable to... to this one, like, I mean, okay. I th I'm sure there's many things sure. that have, like, influenced me, certainly, okay. but something that we've come up together. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. So the first A is avoidance? Avoidance, yeah. Okay, and the second A is acceptance? Awareness. Awareness. Yeah, of feelings, yeah. Awareness of your own internal state? Yes. And how you're relating to this problem? Yes, how you're feeling about the situation, yeah. correct. Okay, so we yeah. go from avoidance to awareness. Yes. Yeah. To acceptance, yes. Yeah. To action, yes. Th those are the four A's. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I think in my case, right, like the the story I was telling you earlier, I was able to move from avoidance to awareness is the second A, right? Yeah. I was able to move from avoidance to awareness pretty quickly because I was scared. I like. I think in some cases fear can be a problem, and in some cases fear can be a great huge motivator, motivator right? certainly. And like the the long term consequences of diabetes are not not something you want to live with. This is a very, very serious diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. Because the complications build up. It takes a long time for the damage to be done in your body. It, it happens over years, decades, right? But eventually it ends up in things like neuropathy, nerve pain, blindness, mm -hmm. right? Like some people have to get limbs amputated, mm -hmm. right? Like these are not things and increased risk for heart disease yeah. and cancer. Like this is scary, scary stuff, yeah. right? And so for me that that shift from like avoidance to awareness happened pretty quickly because I'm scared to death. Yeah. I don't want that to be my life. Right. And, and, and luckily for me, luckily my diagnosis happened early enough. Again, I'm like yeah. 36. So this is pretty young, I think, for 
for for somebody to be yeah. diagnosed. Um, and I feel very lucky that mm. I was diagnosed now rather than later in my yeah. life when I had less time to affect change. Yeah. Now, part of that is just like a mental lever. Part of that is just me sh- changing my perspective and going, I have a lot of agency here. Mm-hmm. Yes. And mm-hmm. I feel grateful for the diagnosis rather than like cursed, yeah. right? So a lot of it has to do with like perspective yeah. is reality. Yeah. You know, what you believe is going to affect how you yeah. live your life. Um, sure. So yeah, so moving from... a avoidance to awareness awareness. and then awareness to acceptance probably took me a a matter of weeks but really Mm -hmm. digging into the research and really familiarizing myself with the medical terminology and the levers that I could pull Mm -hmm. and the metrics that I was measuring success by that really helped me get to acceptance acceptance Acceptance. that's the third day yes yes. within uh within a matter of weeks and then and then action as well right Mm -hmm. so I was able to move through those a's pretty pretty quickly Gosh, within a number wow, of weeks amazing. through like ownership, curiosity, right. a, a positive outlook, mm-hmm. right? And and knowing that I have, uh, you know, an immense amount of potential to, to affect the outcome. Yeah, that's so. wonderful. I really like how you kind of laid out the whole process. Um, and I think it's so interesting because like, we all kind of go through this process with different things. And then we all kind of go through it at different, I guess, like, time periods right but I think one of the most important things that I've realized for myself going through these A's is just really just sitting down and just understanding how I feel about it and just recognizing that hey I am the one who can decide how I think about it and I think for me one of the main things I realized whenever we kind of go through this exercise is that I after I accept that it's okay if I'm not like at my best or I'm not like the, at the top of my game, it's okay if I am not there yet because I can work towards it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like really, that was really important for me to realize in a lot of things. I mean, I can definitely also share my experience with the four A's. Right. And again, these are all like retroactive looking back and I can see that it was really the process that I had to go through. Um, Like when I first learned about, this issue like I was like okay you know um I'm not I'm gonna ignore it you know I don't have a problem <laughs> uh maybe I just kind of weak you know and I you know I just pass out sometimes it's okay I'll just run less <laughs> it's okay <laughs> normal yeah. everybody passes out right no and, and I felt bad I felt ashamed of it right because sure. I thought like you know as a guy I should be able to run you know a marathon certainly right If not, how am I going to be attractive to anybody, right? And my friends were all very fit. They were all all going on the fit track as well. And, you know, we'd all be exercising and they just see me like pass out within like a few minutes. And they're like, what the hell's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know either, you know? So very soon I just stopped doing exercise altogether. I was like, hey, you know what? I don't want to be uh, seen as weak. So if I don't work out, then I won't be seen as weak, right? So my avoidance phase actually lasted quite a bit for this problem. Mm. Like at least a year, right? Mm. Where Mm. I had friends that actively try to get me out to exercise were very understanding certainly too of like my um of my situation like they didn't know what was going on but it's like hey Connor, i can't run too long you know it's okay um but i just never felt okay with that right i always felt like i was being judged even though no one was judging me i was judging myself but i was avoiding it and then i think for me too like i only got really into the awareness stage when i had like an absolute limit of like hey i'm waking up and there's pain in my chest I can't breathe. I'm yeah. passing out, right? And I can't even walk up my stairs of my house without like, you know, feeling really drained and like needing to lie down. This is not okay, right? And that jumped, started and pushed me to like a stage of like, you know what? I am feeling a lot of things here, right? I am scared. I am angry. I am sad. I am ashamed. I am guilty. I am so many things. And most of all, like I, you know, I'm just so worried about how this will affect me in the future, right? And, you know, like I said, there's a lot of knock off effect, lock on, knock on effects for so many things, right? Uh, once you start getting these kind of things going on in your life, so then from there, I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I know my feeling about this. I'm gonna go actually see doctors and actually figure out, you know, what's going on and like research more. But I was still very much putting my life in their hands. I was like, hey, which doctor's gonna save me, right? Who's out there gonna save me and fix my problem and you know change my life, right? And I kept going from one doctor to another to another and just refusing to accept my situation, right? Because I'm just telling them, hey, you you deal with it, 
right? I'm not accepting that I have something that I can change. I'm just saying, hey, someone else should solve it. And to be very honest, when Jess first offered to help, I was like, okay, you do it, right? She created a Notion page for me. It was awesome. Like she created a Notion page. She detailed everything that I sent her because I forwarded all the different like reports I got from my medical doctors, right? And I'm like, hey, wow. Yeah. And, <laughs> wow. and then she like broke it all down. And she contacted her own professors that like had experience in this. Like she did a lot of research. But to be very honest, because I didn't accept my situation yet, I didn't even read most of it right. at the very beginning. You were still yeah. you were still in your like, you had moved from avoidance to awareness, awareness and you uh, were not yet accepting. I haven't accepted that it. this was your This is my this is your agency, journey. this is my journey. Right. People can help me, people can, people that love me will support me, right? Yeah. My doctors can try to help me, these write reports and whatever, but I'm not even willing to read the report or do the research for myself to actually do something about my situation. So of course I'm not gonna get better, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just waiting for someone to save me still. Yeah. So it wasn't until like, I finally had a mental break, right? And I switched from, hey, yes, people are trying to help me, but I cannot be helped until I help myself. Yep. Until I actually open up these resources, read about what's going on with me, and understand it, right? Yep. And then, hell, I can start taking an action about that, right? So I was able to then finally get to the point where, okay, I'm going to read all this, understand what's actually going on with me. I now know what's exactly the limits of my situation. Okay, I hit 180 heart rate, I will pass out. That's a guaranteed fact, okay? So I'm going to buy a watch that tells me my heart rate, right? I'm going to set limits on it. When I'm above 160, Tell me, I'm gonna stop the fuck whatever I talk oh, I'm doing. That's I'm nice gonna feature. sit down yeah, yeah. immediately, yeah. right? I'm not gonna push myself. Yeah, I don't yeah. need to push myself. I don't need to prove myself to anyone that I'm fit, that I'm strong, that I'm gonna be able to do it. I'm a man, right? Whatever that means to anybody, yeah. right? I will sit down at 160. I don't care, right? Yeah. I won't wait till I hit 200, right? Have to pass out. Like I was actually with her at a, uh, it was just like a fun place. Like it was Changi experience. It was like our airport experience place. And like they had this fun thing where, you know, you ride on a bike treadmill, right? Uh, what do you call it? Like a bike uh, exercise bike. Exercise bikes. Yeah. And then like, it's just a game, right? And then you try and race each other to see like who can race the plane the fastest. It doesn't matter. It was just a fun game, right? Sure. Riding that for one minute, 30 seconds. Passed me out and I laid, on, I laid down on, 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 on the floor, on the couch floor, right? And that's how like, we were on like, our fourth date. <laughs> I was so worried that I was gonna like I was gonna make her like you know oh my god like you know she's not gonna like me anymore like I just show like this like worst side of myself etc. I didn't accept myself. It was just pure like avoidance, right? Yeah. So it wasn't until I actually like said, "Hey, this is me, right? I'm gonna tell everyone if I'm about to go exercise with them, I'm like, hey, buddy, I'm gonna have this thing. I'm just let you know. Uh, hope it's okay. I'm just gonna stop at like 160, yeah. right? I'll yeah. keep you updated on my heart rate." It's okay, right? And on top of that, I'm going to do other things during the day that's going to help me slowly build up my um, tolerance so that my heart rate can hopefully be lower in more situations, right, yeah. than having a spike. Yes, COVID, post-COVID symptom has made it spike easier, but that doesn't mean that's the end of the story. There's so many things that you can do to lower your heart rate in different situations. And the whole main thing is like, just don't do like do anything too crazy and that's okay right yeah and so that was an effective action i could take i still haven't gotten a very good answer from any doctor by the way sure. in the end like you know i don't have a heart issue thank god so i'm yeah. not going to die at 30 yay right in my 30s um but you know that he said that hey there's something going on in your neurochemistry right for whatever reason when your heart rate goes up your blood pressure is supposed to go up as well mm -hmm. but you're not doing that so then you're going to have a huge drop in blood pressure just watch out for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. But but you still don't have a deep understanding of like the causal mechanism. You you don't really know like what's going on. No, and it's a very triggering. rare case. It's sure. like a one okay. in the you know I don't yeah. hundred thousand million. Like it's a very rarely documented yeah. case. It does exist, but uh, there might be a surgery. But like it's just like they right. don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. So Jess, I it sounds like you witnessed part of Conrad's journey. Maybe not. You weren't there from the beginning, but you you were here for part of this journey. Um, what do you think helped, what were the like strong, you know, strong elements that helped Conrad transition from, uh, avoidance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to awareness, awareness, to acceptance action? Hmm. Very good question. I think what really changed was you recognizing your situation and you accepting the fact. I think from avoidance to awareness was when like when whatever was happening really affected your life your quality of life right it really affected um how you could you know go about your daily activities with yeah. like 
comfort, right? Yeah. Um, and I and then I think from awareness to acceptance, it was really I think an internal switch within yourself where you're like. I don't want to live like this for the rest of my life. Like I'm sure, like I can, I know I can figure out ways so that I have a better quality of life. And I think recognizing that allowed you to accept, like, hey, I'm not there yet, but there are solutions. There are ways to kind of move forward and mitigate it. And I think once you accepted that, it was really easy for you to take action. I think whenever I was like, "Do you want to go run with me? Do you want to like do this with me?" It's like Okay, yeah, let's do it. And then I think once like we are both aware of it, we're like, it's okay. We can still do these activities; they're fun. But um, we just have to keep in our mind that okay, one sixty is like probably the limit, and then we will like pause at that. Yeah, yeah. So the reason that the action is like the last day in the chain, it's really hard to affect any action if you don't have yeah uh, know, both awareness it. and yeah, acceptance. Yeah, like, because kind of down, right? a lot of times you would maybe start that action mm -hmm. but you don't follow through with it maybe mm -hmm. you do it like like it, as how new year's resolutions always kind of work for mm -hmm. a lot of people or at least for me right i would want to start something but i would never carry through until like march like i would never carry through until march so it was because like oh i didn't really want to do it i just thought it was good mm -hmm. or like or somebody right. else said it was good so you're not fully bought in like, yeah you don't exactly. like really believe yeah it. i was like you I, haven't internalized it as an identity exactly whatever. i was yeah. like oh i probably don't need it but i'll do it because people say it's good right. but like it's not me so then i think that's where like the action is sustainable once you accept where you're at mm -hmm. one of the really important um uh, nuggets that i think i've realized in the last year is that stories are useful tools Mm -hmm. for different circumstances, right? Yeah. And so at different points in our lives, we tell ourselves stories and those may be useful in some circ circumstances and they may be, may be harmful in others. And you yeah. need to be self-aware enough to realize when the story you're telling yourself and everything we, we believe about ourselves is just a story, right? Yeah. You need to be aware, self-aware enough to realize when your story is helping you or when it's hurting you and you, and you need to change the story you're telling. Um, a, a friend of mine gave me a really useful example from her life she had built this narrative that she needed to be perceived as uh very competent like this mm -hmm. was just core to her identity and she needed to you know she needed to believe herself that she's very competent she needed other people to believe that she's competent mm -hmm. and that started to get in her way this year yeah and it was very freeing she went through some some uh some books that helped her kind of remodel how this looked in her mind but where she came out is i'm not awesome in every area i'm not yeah. superhuman mm -hmm. in some areas i'm mediocre yeah and for her that was a really useful story to tell yes. herself at this point in time because it let her release those expectations yeah. that were getting in her own way where she expected herself to always be so competent and to just be able to switch the story and say you know what yeah in some areas of my life I'm average, I'm mediocre, right? <laughs> and and so anyway, so that's just like a, a quick example. But yeah, in your case, in my case, being able to say like, I'm not immortal. Yeah. You know, absolutely. I'm I'm my body is fragile in yeah. some ways. I need to take care of it. Yes. You know, and, and I need to change the way that I live my life in order to support this this body, right? Yeah. It's just a story, right? Like at some points you can tell yourself, I'm a badass, right? <laughs> and that may be helpful monday morning when you're going into a meeting and you need to yeah. like really own the room or whatever it is right yeah, yeah or like you're going into your workout right you're waking yeah. up and you're like i need to crush this thing i'm awesome you know and other times you need to tell yourself i'm fragile i need to give myself like space time to heal i need to be gentle with myself they're yeah. both just stories yes you know what i mean neither one of them is true yeah, yeah right but you need to know what's useful so real quick this episode is proudly supported by the coex3 family foundation and specifically our philosophies over at the.x3.family uh, we have a bunch of amazing things that we've kind of thought up to help you build frameworks into your life to help you overcome situations that you might be going through difficult situations frustrating things you know whatever you might need to process we think there's something there for you to help you really deal with your situation and help you shift your perspective on that and we actually built a 
really cool AI um, assistant as well uh, in cases of situations where you don't have an emotionally available friend near you or someone to talk to to really go through your situation and help you process these things. Of course, reading is one part of it. You can definitely read everything we have on our site. But if you want to talk to someone or talk to uh, an AI assistant in this case, definitely check out Talk It Out. Uh, it's an absolutely free uh, service that we provide um, through ChatGPT. Of course, you would need a ChatGPT subscription, but uh, for us, uh, we're offering it to you free of charge. We're also going to be building it uh, also on our own sites, uh, probably for free as well. So you can check that out. And probably also on the site, there's like this little search uh, button you can press. And that also connects with an AI assistant that can also give you some advice. Uh, but definitely check that out and see if that will help you and help you overcome any situation and just really talk it out. I think that is the main idea. Uh, Drew, you've had some experience with the AI chatbot. Maybe you can just tell the audience a bit about how you felt like it was talking to you. Yeah, I used the Talk It Out chatbot the other day and I was I was really impressed. I wasn't sure what to expect, but it was way more natural and and human-like in conversation than I expected it to be. It was uh, insightful and intuitive in ways that I didn't really expect a uh, chatbot to be. Um, and I loved, you know, specifically, I loved the the voice characteristics. Like it, I mean, the, the, the voice technology is really impressive, right? It feels like talking to a person. There's no, you're not like, this is animatronic. There's none of that. It was really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really had fun uh, talking. And I actually think um, I could use it in a way that would be helpful, like talking through, um, you know, maybe I want to use it to like think through a problem. Difficult or, situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, help me reflect. Help, yeah. I want to talk out loud. Help me reflect. And I want to get to some solutions here. I actually think it'd be really useful tool for that. Same. I think for me, how it's really helped me is when, when I was in difficult situations, you're not really, uh, I wasn't really sure how to think about it because like there are emotions happening, but you're like, hey, but this is what I can do. But then I'm like, I was just really need to vent about the situation. And I think the chatbot really helped kind of put that into a more linear processing. So then you're kind of working through like how, what you think about it, how you feel about it, why did it happen? And then you get to the solutions afterwards. So I think it was a really good guide for me. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, if you feel shy talking to people, try chatbot. But if you do want to talk to us too, we have an amazing community over at Coex3. Uh, Drew is a lovely part of our family. Uh, we've known him for a long time. We finally see each other in person. And I think it's just a beautiful place. You can make lifelong friends and uh, hopefully we can see you there soon. So with that, let's get back to the episode. So, Absolutely. And I think that's why I love conversations like this, because I think it's really important to be reminded of this from time to time that like, hey, you know, our perspective is our reality, right? And how we choose to see the world will affect how the world shows up to us. Mm -hmm. And I think so often, again, we get actionable advice, certainly from all sorts of resources online, right? Whether it be doctors or whatnot. But really, I just found that it doesn't matter if you haven't overcome your emotional barrier of how you're thinking about the situation and how you're perceiving it to actually effectively take action. I think it explains a lot about why a lot of people, sometimes you look at them and you're like, hey, how come they're not taking action on this right now? It looks so easy, right? From my vantage point, like it's so easy to just do something. Um, but the answer is they just need to go through their process and work through it, right? Whether it be going through avoidance or awareness or acceptance, um, whatever it might be, they need to work through all that uh, to then take an effective action on their life. And I think to me, that is like the biggest takeaway in all this. And thank you so much for like, I think, summarizing that too. I think, you know, there's so many stories to tell ourselves. And I think you absolutely should lean into that. I think it's a great tool to use if you can use it properly, right? It's like, hey, in this position, I'm going to think this way. And that's going to help me be the most effective person I can be, uh, the best self I can be for the situation. Yeah. And just a little bit more to add on. I think your example about shifting your diagnosis from... Um, something that's bad to like something that's a blessing, I think was mm -hmm. beautiful because I think that to me seemed like where you were able to like really take that narrative you have for yourself and then take action on it. So I thought when you like gave that example, I was like, wow, that's so yeah. beautiful. Can I expand on my own? Please. So I deliberately, I think I have a naturally positive and optimistic outlook, which I'm, you know, I'm grateful for. Uh, but I think you have a large amount of agency. It's just my belief. I think you also have a large amount of agency in the stories you tell yourself. 
Yeah. And so uh, there are certain days. It's not like I'm I'm optimistic every single day. Sometimes it's hard, right? Yeah. But there are days when I tell myself, um, "Man, this sucks. It sucks yeah. having diabetes. I'm limited because I can't eat all of the foods that I would want to eat mm-hmm. whenever I want to eat them." Right? Like I'm I'm not living life without limits. Whatever. There yeah. there are times when when it's hard, right? And I'm telling myself a a negative story, a story of limitation. Um, but the story that I choose to tell myself most often is that this is a superpower, yeah. right? Having diabetes is like, and having a diagnosis and having the knowledge when you're young and you have a lot of time to like affect yes. action. Look, you're always young, right? Like, I don't care if your <laughs> if your yes. diagnosis happens when you're 50 or 60 or 65 or 75, right? Like, we live a long time now and you don't know how many years are ahead of you. So you're always young. You always have time to change. And I turn it into a superpower by saying, this is a blessing yeah. because I get to know that I have maybe a, pre- a genetic predisposition to this, or I've got metabolic syndrome that is going to turn this into uh, problematic, yeah. you know, things for me. So I need to eat well. I need to take care of my body. I need to get enough sleep. I need to exercise. Yeah. I need to not like overload my, my metabolism. Yeah. And you can just, if you can get yourself in a mindset, right? Yeah. And a lot of this, I think, comes down to stories and emotional regulation and knowing yourself and yeah. mindfulness and being at peace and all those things, things, right? Yeah. If you can get yourself to a place where you turn the story around and you go, this is a superpower, yeah. right? Now I get to live life in a way that was very hard when I was more connected to food and like, oh, this sucks. I can't eat all the carbs that I want. Now, a lot of times I can be like, I live better than other people because I know that those carbs aren't good for me. I know they're yes. not good for my metabolism. And look, what am I really avoiding when I'm, yeah. you, this is getting into like, you know, diabetes, Dactyl, like what am yeah. I, what am I avoiding? Processed sugars, processed yeah. flours, mm-hmm. white rice, potatoes, bread, pizza, pasta. You know what I mean? It's like all the stuff that's like not, we not know is not anyway. good for you anyway. Yeah. And just by changing my story and kind of like yeah. seeing it from the other side, seeing it as a superpower, I'm living life better. Yes. My body fat's lower. I'm losing weight. My metabolism is is healthier. Yeah. I'm more fit. Yes. Right. Like Absolutely. we talk about cardiovascular fitness. Yes. I'm more fit. I'm more able to, you know, tackle the world, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And it starts with identification. Knowing. It starts yes. with, you know, how do you identify? It starts with the story you tell yourself. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, if you can figure out how to turn your story into from like a a detractor to this is a superpower, right? Yes. I actually 100% agree. And I would say that, you know, I love that you've already identified that this is actually making you healthier and a better self than if you didn't have this diagnosis, yeah. right? And I can say exactly the same thing for me too. It's like, hey, I am much more careful of my body and I take much more care of it because I know that there is something that I, you know, there's a limit that I have to hit, right? And instead of seeing it as a limit, I'm like, hey, I'm so glad I know this, that this is something that is in my life so I can actually do something about it. And it's going to make me healthier than if I never knew about this at all. My life is better because of this, yeah. right? Um, and again, I wish as humans, we could be motivated by other things than just pain <laughs> and bad news. <laughs> but as, as both things goes, uh, that is one of the biggest motivators is fear and is, uh, you know, these things that happen to us. But if we can take it in stride and we can try our best to uh, reframe our perspective on it. I think yeah. it will do us a lot of good. And I do want to say this with a lot of empathy to anyone who is going through anything difficult, who is going through something chronic. You know, obviously, you know, you don't want anyone on your any high horse to tell you, hey, just change your how you feel about it. I'm not saying how to change how you feel. I think it's actually okay to say, hey, this sucks. I suck today, right? But what does it mean to you, right? How do you accept that that is something that is going to be you know, in your life, right? Because you can either choose to believe that, hey, it sucks, it sucks, it sucks. Why me, why me, why me for the rest of your life? Or you could be like, hey, this happened to me. It's okay, right? It's not the best. I, I, don't, I wouldn't wish it on myself. But now how does this help empower me to do more, right? And I think that in itself is something that can be applicable, not just for dealing with any chronic illness, but just any form of personal developments that you want to do for yourself. Really, yeah, I take this even to a bit more of an extreme. Yeah. And again, this is not this is not victim blaming. This isn't telling you how you should think or how you should sure. live your life. What works for you? This is a tool yeah. that's worked well in my life. So I want to provide it as a possible tool for other people. Yeah. Um, if you really want to take personal ownership, 
mm-hmm. of the thing that you struggle with. For some people, it may be, and again, a lot of this is just stories we're telling ourselves, right? In my case, it's diabetes. In your case, it's cardiovascular fitness, mm-hmm. I think, right? Yeah, and, and, and some head issues. Yeah. We'll, we'll fast that. <laughs> for some other people, it may be, you know, everybody's got their own struggles that they're yeah. trying to work through. I don't tell myself that I have diabetes. Mm-hmm. I tell myself that I'm practicing diabetes. <laughs> right? Is that is that like, like that. a perspective shift? Right? Yeah. Maybe maybe your thing is anger. Maybe you're a hangry person and you lash out and you're not kind to your partner or your friends or your coworkers. And instead of telling yourself, "Oh, I have anger issues," maybe you're practicing anger. Mm. Right? Yeah. Maybe those negative emotions don't happen to you yeah maybe your emotions are things they're habits that you practice on a daily basis and you're really 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 good yeah. at responding or reacting to the world in the, in the same way you did yesterday right yeah, yeah. i'm practicing diabetes every time i eat a donut wow. i'm practicing diabetes aren't i right and again this is not blaming anybody who uh, thinks yeah. about their own circumstances differently yeah. but i have agency over what i eat yeah. mm. And in my case, my diabetes is driven by carbohydrate toxicity, right? I've, mm. I've overloaded my system, my liver, my pancreas, the, the body fat storage mm. in my system has been overloaded because I ate too much, I gained too much weight. And when I eat a donut, I now have the perspective that I'm practicing diabetes, okay. right? Okay. I can either practice diabetes or I can practice fitness, mm. right? Yeah. Every moment I have a choice. Right. Yeah. And that that doesn't mean that I always practice perfectly. I still choose. See, Mm. I love pastries. Mm -hmm. Right. So I still choose. I I still make that choice often. But it's very useful for me to know that I'm the one in control. Mm -hmm. I'm the one making the decision. And if I get upset and if I lash out, I'm practicing anger. Mm -hmm. If I, you know, am wallowing in whatever self regret, I'm practicing that emotion. And if I choose to eat the pastry, and and then my doctor tells me, hey, your A1C is out of control. Well, guess who practiced that, right? Mm. Who got me to that point? Mm -hmm. I love that. I think it really changes something from that. Maybe something like someone threw at you to something like, I choose this. This is something I choose. And it's just so much more powerful to realize that agency is within you. Yeah, that's right. Did I make you angry? No. Did I make you sad? I choose to be sad and I choose to be angry in those situations. And you may not even be choosing it. Yeah. But that emotion mm. welled up within you. Yeah. The emotions happened within your body. I didn't mm. sprinkle anger yeah. over your head, right? Yeah. Like I didn't make you do anything. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm an mm-hmm. asshole. Maybe, maybe I'm a hard coworker to work with. Mm. Maybe I'm a jerk. Maybe I'm a bad boyfriend. But did I make you angry? Mm. No. You got angry. You practiced yes. anger yeah. in response or reaction to something, something that happened. Outside. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. And... I, I agree with that train of thought. I would tell you like how I apply it. And I think it's perhaps from a, yeah, uh, maybe a softer approach. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I like, I like, but I like, I like the angle, yeah, yeah, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how I choose to think about it is like, am I my best self? Am I practicing my best self? Right. And I believe that I have a choice, right? Something terrible happens in my vicinity. I can choose to be my best self, which may look upon that with empathy and with acceptance and with love, right? To myself and to the other person, right? Or whoever's involved. Or I can choose to react in a very primal way, like, oh, this sucks, you know? I hate this, right? And punch out whatever is happening in front of me. And so I like to think about it as like, there are going to be infinite situations that are going to be existing. And you have the choice to react however you want to react. Yes, it's going to feel angry. It's going to feel disappointing when someone, you know, doesn't meet your expectations. It's going to feel a lot of things. But how you choose to react to that, actually, to me, is going to directly affect if that's going to happen again to you, right? It's going to, if that situation is going to happen again in exactly the same way. And more often than not, you know, you can't, when I say the situation is going to happen again, is how you react to that situation again. So, like, if you practice something, you practice getting angry at a certain situation, you're going to, react the same angriness next time again it's not going to be any different and guess what you're going to blame yourself you're going to go into a situation where you're like hey why is the world such a bad place right why do i feel angry all the time but if you practice that hey you know what this thing happened it is bad you can make a judgment i don't think you shouldn't make judgments you could right but 
then you apply it upon yourself. Say, do I have to react like it's the worst thing in the world, right? And maybe as you keep practicing it, like, hey, this was a good thing, you know, whatever, right? Um, I can see a silver lining here. I can do something with this, right? I can improve my life because of whatever happened. Um, then, hey, your life might just improve, right? Can we do a really quick exercise? I'm just curious with yeah. this framework of like, maybe your negative emotions or the thing you're struggling with, or, yeah. or in my case, it's even a, um, a medical condition, right? Yeah. And I've just framed it as I'm practicing diabetes, right? Yeah. When I choose to eat foods that I shouldn't eat, right? <laughs> I wonder if each one of us could identify like one or two things in our life where that perspective change is really useful, where mm -hmm. I'm practicing in my case, right? Like I'll just give a personal example. Like if I'm getting out the door late, I, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a common occurrence for me. I'm, <laughs> I'm oftentimes, you know, five minutes late, 10 minutes cool. late. And it sometimes that really bothers my friends, mm -hmm. right? Um, I can change that to say like, I'm not, you know, the, the, the perspective change wouldn't be, wouldn't be like, I'm uh, bad with time management. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm practicing poor time management, <laughs> right? Or something like that, right? So I don't know, yeah. do, you, do you have something in your life? Do you have something in your life that you might, that where this could be useful? Yeah, um, it's funny. I think for me, I am practicing self-pity sometimes. Mm. Like things happen and um, I interpret it as, oh, they don't understand me. I don't feel appreciated or supported. And then I'm wallowing in self-pity. And then mm. because I practice it so often, it's just really easy to go into to that go loop. Yeah, yeah. So I think for me, it's like practicing. What's the opposite of self-pity? Um, self-esteem, self-confidence, self-agency. Agency, ownership. Yeah. Yeah. Practicing. Self-love. Self-love, self yes. Yeah. The most important, like, positive feedback loop for me, though, like, has been loving every experience mm. to the absolute degree. Like, and, and you can't notice, like, I'm gonna try to explain something to you, and if you have this, have something at home, like, try picking something up, like, anything. Like, try picking up, like, because I'm also admired by Mike, okay? So, look at Pick up something off your table or off your desk or wherever you're at and start staring at it. Look at all the different fibers of, you know, the thing that you're observing. For me, I'm going to describe what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a mic, right? There's nice little black fibers coming from it. It's kind of fluffy. It's kind of cute, right? Uh, there's a bit of a wind blowing, so it's kind of moving a little bit. There's a nice, like, blue color and red color on the mic that's showing. I love the way that it glistens off, you know, the sun and, you know, there's a little bit of, like, a shine to it. And like, it's just beautiful, right? So if what I realized when you apply like a pure focus on anything that you look at, you can instantly turn it from like a regular object into a beautiful thing because you're just observing it from a whole different vantage point that you haven't seen before. So for me, my positive feedback loop is just every single thing is beautiful. Like I used to have situations where I would look at something. I'm like, this sucks. You know, this looks so ugly. This is not good, you know? And that could apply to, you know, objects that apply to people, right? Like the people I'm dealing with, right? Whether it be at work or, you know, my life, my loved ones. Like, hey, I don't like the way that they're operating right now. Really? Is there nothing I can appreciate about how they look and how they, you know, how beautiful even this moment is, right? How beautiful your eyes are, right? So, you know, nice blue eyes, right? <laughs> All right. How lovely her smile is, right? I think these are just the amazing moments that I like, like to focus on that like just completely radically change the way I see the world and just make me a happier person. Yeah. yeah. And then what we were talking about earlier about holding two things in your mind at once is yeah. like, yeah, a lot of times that's what it takes to make personal progress is realizing you are perfectly fine as you are. Yeah. That's a useful narrative. Yes. At some points. And that's really, you know, what you're describing is like meditation, like, yeah. true, like mindfulness, true mindfulness, yes. right? Like being in the moment, being present, realizing life is okay as it is right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Everything's great. And maybe and, even beautiful. And, and, right? and beautiful and finding like the, the things to cherish in the present moment, not thinking about the past or the yeah. future, right? It's like, it's, it's mindfulness, right? Yeah. And that's like, and so we're perfectly okay as we are. Mm -hmm. And yet we want to change. We want to get better. We want to yeah. grow. Yes. Um, and those two things seem like they're at odds, right? And you have yeah. to be able to kind of hold both and, and use which one is, is useful at, at the time you're, you need yeah. whatever story it is. But I think it's really important to start from that position yeah. because if you can, if you can get to that point in your life where you're like, Hey, yeah. I've got, friends i've got my health even yeah. if it's 
not perfect. I've got Absolutely. my health. Yeah. I've got my, you know, the things in your life that you're grateful for, whatever that is for you, yeah. you start there. Absolutely. And then you identify, okay, but I also <laughs> want to change. Sure. And it's, it doesn't mean that that's not true. It doesn't mean that you're not okay no. right now. You know, yeah. but you go, I want to finish my education. I yeah. want to build this business. I want to yeah. change how I show up in the world. I want to yes. change how I show up in my relationships. Yes. Right. And then you use Shift that. Yeah. yeah. I want to add, like, again, this confused me so much, right? In the past, it's like, hey, how do I accept my today while still being in a growth mindset that I want to change and improve? If yeah. I accept who I am today, then I don't need to change. I'm great. I'm perfect, right? Yeah. So the way that I've transformed my thinking is that, yes, one is that, like, if you can hold both opinions, right? I'm perfect, but I could be better, and that's okay, sure. right? Yeah. Ideally. But one thing that also really helped me is that, like, I'm perfect because I'm trying my best every day to be my best self. That's why mm. I'm perfect, right? Sure. I'm trying my best, right? Yeah. And my best doesn't mean that I actually tried hard today. It just means I did my best. Today wasn't a shit day. You know, I was tired. You know, I couldn't do my best. Yeah. That's still my best, right? And, <laughs> and in those moments, those yeah. days that are crap, yeah. treating yourself with compassion and Correct. grace is being your best self. Exactly. Right? Maybe because, yes. and maybe that's not true for everybody. Yeah. Some, some people, the way they're going to achieve what they want to achieve yeah. is to be hard on themselves that day and be like sure you sucked you should have been better sure for you maybe the path to progress yeah. is love self-love compassion Passion, grace, kindness charity yeah. right but but knowing yourself knowing how progress happens for you yeah starting from a place of acceptance and beauty and being grounded in the moment yes. and then, yeah absolutely and i think this is a great end to the episode um how i like to have in the episodes is like one message that you'd like to share with someone that might have been in your shoes or is in your shoes, um, you know, just maybe a year ago, right? Sure. What would you like to tell them? Yeah. So this, you know, if we go to the four A's framework, we yeah. talked about avoidance, awareness, acceptance, actions. So now yeah. I want to talk about action because yeah. we, we talked about, in my case, the thing that I've had a lot of personal growth with over the last five months mm -hmm. is how to live life with type 2 diabetes yeah. and get that out of my life, right? Yeah. To get to a healthier, fitter place where I don't have those symptoms, yes, right? And where my metabolic markers, my my clinical markers say mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm free of that, right? Yes. We've also touched just now on like a really important thing, I think for anybody, which is mindfulness, yeah. right? So I want to give some resources. My go-to resource for practicing mindfulness mm -hmm. and really good meditation practices is an app called Waking Up. It's well worth paying for this app because it yeah. really taught me, um, you know, I've used Calm, I've used Headspace, yeah. um, I've used other meditation apps, but the teacher in this app, Sam Harris, has a really unique um, way and I think a very deep way of approaching mindfulness yeah. in a way that's not so... You, it's kind of like what we were talking about earlier, where you can tell somebody, okay, like start a body scan, start at the top of your head yeah. and move down. Or you can say, focus on, you know, the can the flame of the candle in your mind and just like keep that focus. You can, yeah. you can tell people like how to meditate in that way. Mm -hmm. But waking up really teaches you how to like, you were describing the objects and finding the beauty yeah. and staying in the moment. And it also has this feature that I love, which is that every, um, one to three times in a day, just randomly, it'll just send you a random a reminder, uh, yeah. moment. There's yeah. small, like one minute meditations yeah. on life, on consciousness, on mm -hmm. being present, on accepting. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. It, it, there's a wide range of, of value. And I just love those little interruptions in your day to kind of remind you to be mindful, present, to be present. mindful, to practice, practice meditation, even if it's in a difficult situation, even if it's in traffic or during a... A, a tense meeting or whatever. Sure. So that's my mindfulness yeah. resource mm -hmm. is is waking up. Highly recommend it. For type 2 diabetes, I mentioned the podcast that I, my go-to resource is um, Mastering Blood Sugar okay. with Dr. Brian Mole. But the, the takeaway, the notes that I would say for anybody who is trying to make action, if you're in the action phase and you're congratulations. ready. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> if you're in the action phase and the topic that we're trying to make progress on is... Uh, metabolic dysfunction, specifically type 2 diabetes, here's what I would say. Here's wh what's worked well for me. The metric that I'm trying to affect is really, re the, the, the base level is visceral adipose tissue, VHE, right? Mm -hmm. That's the fat that's accumulated around your organs, right? This is when we talk about like fatty liver disease. My core, the North Star metric yeah. that I'm trying to affect is getting my visceral adipose tissue to zero. Okay. That's, that's the target. That's mm -hmm. like, at the core, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. 
um, because that's where a lot of this metabolic dysfunction starts. And the great news is, is that lowering your body fat, specifically the visceral adipose tissue, as opposed to the uh, subcutaneous adipose tissue, the, okay. the fat under your skin isn't as harmful as the fat around your organs, right? Mm. So we talked about fatty liver disease. We talk about, you know, these things. And, and I think a lot of us hear it. It's not impossible to measure. You can go get a DEXA scan, mm. right? So you, at, at least here in California, we have a service available. Okay. It takes six minutes to scan your body and it gives you a full printout and it shows you exactly how much um, bone density and, and water and, and lean, lean mass and fat mass. Uh, but what's really, really helpful for it, it's, it's a very accurate measurement, but it also shows you how much visceral adipose tissue you have, which is the fat accumulated around your organs. In my mm -hmm. case, what I'm trying to do is burn off all that fat in my liver, around my pancreas, things like that, mm -hmm. and give my body a chance to heal, yeah. to, to be still, to not constantly be fighting um, you know, against all the carbohydrates that I'm shoving in my mouth. You right, know what I mean? Right, yeah. uh, so, North Star metric, visceral adipose tissue, you can measure it getting a DEXA scan. Mm -hmm. Some ways to measure that on a day-to-day -day basis, because I can't go get a DEXA scan every day, right? Yeah. It costs about 45 to $60, I think, depending on where you get it. So that's not about right. Mm -hmm. um, and some people get a DEXA scan once every quarter, yeah. a couple times a year. You know, some people maybe do it once a month if they're really extreme. But on a day-to-day -day basis, I can measure my my body fat using like a, a body weight scale. We were talking about withings. Yeah. Yeah, body weight scale, waist to hip, uh, body weight scale, waist to hip ratio is also okay. So that means your uh, waist circumference to your hip circumference. Um, those are the two really like at home measures you can do easily. Yep. And in my case, what I use is a is a, a smart scale. I, I bought it for about it's the Withings brand, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I paid a hundred to one hundred and twenty for this scale. It connects mm -hmm. to my phone. I measure myself every morning. Mm -hmm immediately after I get up before I've hydrated um, so that I just have an accurate measurement day to day. Mm -hmm. And it's not perfect, right? This isn't as accurate for a body fat measurement yeah. as like maybe that, some other methods, yeah. but it's something I can get daily feedback on. Yeah, right? yeah. And I think it's also useful to see your trends for right. that. And then I think that's the main thing. Yep, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that lets me know, right? So over the course of the last you know, my diagnosis was in November. We're currently in April. So I've had mm. about five months. I've dropped from maybe 21% body fat down to 17 or something. And at my mm, highest, I was really at like 24, 25. Mm. So, you know, I've made progress from 24 down to 21. Now I'm around 17% body fat mm -hmm. for a male. You know, that's maybe at the high end of the healthy range. Mm -hmm. But I think in order for me to accomplish the goals I want to get, which is to burn off yeah. all that VAT, mm -hmm. I need to get my body fat percentage much Sorry. lower. I'm mm -hmm. headed towards, I don't know, but 14, 15. 13, mm -hmm. 12. I don't know, maybe it's 10% mm -hmm. body fat. Um, so that's kind of my daily measurement is, is that. And then tactics, right? Like how am I affecting this change? Those are the metrics. Those mm. are the things I'm measuring. Yeah. How do I get there? No snacking. We have a really bad habit in North America. You can tell me if this carries across <laughs> other cultures you're familiar with. Yeah. But in North America, we love to snack. Mm. And my understanding is that in Europe, they don't. Right. Mm. And I think some other cultures have learned this, that you shouldn't just constantly be eating every two hours. And I'm not a doctor and I'm not giving you advice. This is what I've heard from doctors, mm. which is that it's very unhealthy for your body to constantly have to be pumping insulin yeah. because you're always filling your, your blood with yeah. more glucose because you're always eating, yeah. right? Yeah. And so your body never gets downtime. You're mm -hmm. always metabolizing and that's yeah. not healthy, right? Ideally, what you want is to have long fasting periods. After a meal, it takes your body three to four hours to get back to a fasted state. Mm -hmm. So I eat at 1 p.m. It's going to take me until maybe 4 to 5 p.m. to for my body to get back to a fasted state. Mm -hmm. And what I want is I want to take that fasting period as long as I can. So if I'm constantly eating snacks between meals, my body never gets a chance to rest except when I sleep. Yeah. So what I want to do is one, no snacking, two, no eating after dinner. If you're done at if you, if dinner is done at 8 p.m., you're done for the night. Ideally, like if you can get it back to six, great. And if you can swing it earlier, great. Like some people, some days I'm done at 3 p.m. I'll eat like a late lunch and that's mm -hmm. kind of my last meal. Mm -hmm. So what this gets to is intermittent in, intermittent fasting, fasting, right? So yeah. the longer we can extend our fasting periods between meals the more time our body has where it's not, where it's resting and not creating insulin yeah. and, and having to go through the metabolic processes. Um, 
some other things that help regulate your blood glucose is, you know, making sure you're getting enough protein for, per meal, reducing the carbohydrates. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about vegetables and, and healthy things, you know, like your greens, mm -hmm. your carrots, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about rice, pasta, bread, potatoes, yeah. uh, processed sugars, processed flours, yeah. cut that stuff down as, as little as you can. Yeah. Um, and then fill the rest of your fat, your, your body, your fill the rest of your diet with healthy Deep fats, fat. right? Yep. Fish oils, salmon, avocado, nuts, nut butters, butter. peanut butter, almond butter, walnut butter, macadamia nut butter, uh, dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. These are things that, that have worked well for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I, the, the thing that I heard from one doctor is you, you prioritize protein, you cut carbs and you fill with, fill with fat, fill the rest of your meal with fat, okay. right? This has worked well for me. So I try and, you know, keep my carbs below, uh, you know, I, I don't want to give ranges, but what I've heard doctors say is that if you can get, if you can keep, even my own doctors that have um, advised me, if you can keep it below 60 grams of carbs per meal, mm -hmm. great. Lower is better. And mm -hmm. some people are really extreme on this. Some people will try and, people who are trying to reverse diabetes will keep their uh, consumption to under 60 grams of carbs per day or oh. under 30 grams of carbs per day. That's hard to do. But depending on how extreme you want to go with this, the point is, you know, reduce your carbohydrates, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. walk after meals, yeah. you know, after you eat, you're going to experience a glucose yeah. spike. So if you get out for at least 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, for me, I like to go longer, but at least a 10, 15 minute walk is going to help smooth out that, that blood sugar spike. Mm -hmm. Um, and then doing like hit workouts yeah. is, is an important part. Um, the diet's probably the most important part, mm -hmm. but hit workouts are, are something you can do to kind of help your body burn off more of that fat. Yeah. So what I'll do is like, I will wake up and I'll do a, a fasted hit workout. You know, I'll, I'll try and do a hit workout in the morning before I eat. That way I've had a long fasting period overnight mm -hmm. and I get up and I'm doing that hit workout in a fasted state. Mm -hmm. uh, and then prioritizing sleep. You yeah. know, making sure you get right. whatever your body needs. For yeah. me, that's probably seven to eight hours a night. Um, that's really going to help your metabolism. Sure. So anyway, if you're trying to tackle, you know, un unhealthy, unregulated metabolism, those are some of the things that have worked really well for me. The funny thing is like, I think that's applicable for everybody. Right? Yeah. I, I'm hearing that. I'm like, Isn't I want to do that. <laughs> Isn't it, it's funny because whether you're trying to lower your cholesterol, you're trying to lower your blood glucose, you're trying to lose body weight, body fat, it's kind of all the same, same. advice. There yeah. might be, you know, 10%, 20% differences yeah. around the edges, yeah. but it's mostly... Yeah. You might focus on like one thing a little bit more than the other, right. but this is based on my studies, like the standard recommendations for our healthy lifestyle, because it really is an all rounded approach to make sure that you're just healthy, like nutritionally and physically. Right. Here's one other key that most people don't do. But if you are in my position where you're really trying to reduce your, your blood sugar spikes, your blood glucose, you eat everything else in the meal before the carbohydrates. So the foods that are high in carbs, I save those for the end of the meal. Mm. And I eat my fats, my fibers, my proteins before carbs. So I'll mm. say it again. Fat, fiber, protein, eat all that stuff first mm -hmm. and then eat the carbs last. And that actually works, you yeah. know, if you're going to eat dessert, like eat dessert at the end of the meal, right? If you're going to have something that's like just kind of pure carbs like rice or bread or you know, eat that at the end of the meal, but start with your protein, start with your fiber, start with your fat. What's the rationale? Is it that because you're more full, so you're less likely to eat more carbs? Or is it that your body will digest and absorb all the fats and fiber first before the carbs? I think it's more the second, mm. not a doctor, but I think it's more Absolutely. the second that the fiber and the fat helps slow down the absorption of carbohydrates. Mm, like if you okay. just eat, you know, white rice and nothing else, yeah. like your body is just going to start metabolizing that, that. but if you've already got like things that are high in fiber Fibers. fat it probably take some of the energy away to like right. digest that first yeah. but mm. i think the the first thing you mentioned is also true if mm. i fill up on my healthy fats my healthy proteins right. things that are high in fiber i'm not gonna i'm probably not as likely to eat as many that's of the carbs, carbs. Mm, that's fair yeah that's fair. Wow. yeah i think that's beautiful and to share i think some of my I guess healthy tips <laughs> in the same vein. Like I think what I've learned is you want to be very aware of 
your situation. So like I think getting a tracking watch or some sort of like I think people use whoop or like aura rings and stuff like that, absolutely recommend because at least you know how your body's performing. Uh, if you have any cardiovascular issues, at least you know how what your HRV is. You need, you know what your resting heart rates are. You know when you have like spikes and they're not super healthy for you. So these are super useful things. At least they can warn you before something bad happens to you, which I think is super important. Um, I also have uh, just to close the loop. Like um, my head condition is that I have chronic head pain, and that comes because also COVID related. Where um, apparently I have some nerves uh, in my nose that are really close to the wall of my nose and so when uh after covid my nose gets swollen and inflamed more easily right um and that presses against nerves and i get nerve head pain and that's the worst kind of head pain you can get because you know nothing helps that advil doesn't help Tylenol doesn't help you need to have like nerve pain medication and so obviously that's not something you want to take long term. Uh, so they did give me some steroids uh, sprays that I can spray in my nose, kind of reduce inflammation, um, also have some decongestants to kind of lower it. Uh, but if that is your situation, I guess uh, just um, try to avoid allergy, allergy, allergens, allergens yeah. Um, so anything that might trigger like more inflamed nose, uh, try to not catch cold. Again, that's not something you can always do, but get vitamin C in. But like what I've realized and similar to Drew is that like now what I do in my whole life, like just as a total lifestyle improvement is I just make sure that I am taking the vit- multivitamins I need, right? Keeping up my immune system so I don't get sick, which you should try to do it anyway, right? Um, tracking my health, which I also recommend, right? Seeing your heart rate, seeing how it improves over time as you do different cardiovascular activities, uh, doing some, like, uh, I like doing a lot of walks now, right? So I don't need to do anything too strenuous. I don't need to run, right? You don't need to push yourself super hard, but do walks, right? So you can get some like active, uh, I think one hour of active uh, heart rate. What, what's the thing you say? Um, uh, you mean for everyday activity? Yeah. It's usually 30 to 60 minutes of some type of moderate low intensity activity don't quote me on this but um usually try to get some activity every day even 10 minutes is that full absolutely yeah um do you have any last health tips from the actual person qualified no (laughs) (laughs) not qualified um i think for me personally um i found that i value sleep a lot more so i'm someone who also requires seven to eight hours of sleep so i do try to uh sleep well enough because then your body can also repair itself and you know keep you stronger keep your immune system stronger um and i mainly focus on diet eating well and reducing my snacks and sugar salt tea snack intakes and i think exercising for me really helps both from a health physical health perspective but also from a mental health perspective because when i move my body it kind of jolts me out of like any low moods that I've been in. So it really helps to, for me to, I usually like running every day if I can. So, cause that's like moving my body. So yeah, diet, exercise and sleep, which I think everybody tells you to do. Yeah. And, and from listening to the Mastering Blood, Blood Sugar podcast, one of the episodes, one of the um, doctors actually prioritized these. And he said the order he would prioritize these is sleep is the most important. Mm-hmm stress right so whatever you can do work-wise work-life balance Mm -hmm. work-life harmony whatever you want to say family situations friend Mm -hmm. situations so sleep stress nutrition exercise supplements so Mm -hmm. if your go-to is like what can i take that is going to fix this that you're starting at the wrong place you should start by getting enough sleep yeah reducing and managing stress which that's that's hard that's i think that is a hard topic Mm -hmm. but again what we were talking about with mindfulness meditation, self-acceptance, yeah. self-love, a lot of those tools can be useful there. There, uh, Nutrition is huge for yes. for what I'm working on. Yeah. yeah. Exercise, that. Yeah. supplements, yeah. right? So. I think one, one minor thing, um, maybe a lot of people know this already, already, but your diet is probably the biggest factor for your health condition. It probably yep. pays, plays like 70 to 80% of the role and then exercise kind of fulfills remaining 20 to 30 percent so like i think diet if there's anything to 
you want to learn more about, learn about diet, learn about nutrition. I think that's really important. Yep. I, I asked, uh, I used to hire a nutrition coach yeah. and I did the same, you know, and <laughs> I asked her at one point and this was, I, I was doing CrossFit and then also uh, hired a, a nutrition coach who was also a, a CrossFit uh, coach at the gym. And I asked her like, which one would you rather I do? If I only had to choose one for the day, would yeah. you rather I like hit the macros? In my case, I was counting macros. That's not the only approach. But, yeah. you know, would you rather I like hit the macros and like, you know, eat the way you're advising me to do? Or would you rather I come get a CrossFit workout in? And sh that's exactly what she said. 80, 20, 80% mm -hmm. is nutrition, 20% yeah. is exercise. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us on this episode. Thank you, Drew, for inviting us to your lovely home, yeah. for letting us use this beautiful space. Uh, we are so lucky to have you in our lives. And I hope uh, people at home can resonate with what you have to share and hopefully don't have to go through as many of the trials and tribulations that we've gone through to deal with our um, life-changing, altering uh, diagnoses. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. <laughs> yes. Bye-bye now. See you guys next week. <laughs>